Welcome back to GI 101. My name is Dr. Dan Sadesky, and I'm a gastroenterologist at the University of Alberta Hospital in Edmonton. Today we wish to talk about esophageal manometry, and probably nothing has revolutionized the study of the esophagus like the Chicago classification of esophageal motility disorders. And we have a new iteration of Chicago classification 4.0, and with me in the studio is Dr. Adrian Lazarescu, who was one of the co-authors of that new classification scheme. And I wanted to sit down with Dr. Lazarescu today and to discuss some of the updates, how Chicago 4.0 differs from 3.0. So this is my conversation now with Dr. Adrian Lazarescu. Hi, Adrian. Welcome back to GI 101. Hi, Dan. Happy to be back. So let's talk about Chicago 4.0, and in particular, let's talk about EGJ outflow obstruction. Sure. I think that that has been one of the most significant refinements compared to the version 3.0. And so do you want to just talk a little bit and remind our listeners about what we mean by EGJ outflow obstruction? Sure. As you know, during a swallow, the lower esophageal sphincter should relax. This is measured as the integrated relaxation pressure, or IRP. If the median IRP is less than 15 millimeters of mercury, then the LES is said to relax appropriately during swallows. In a patient with sufficient peristalsis in the esophageal body and an IRP which is greater than 15 millimeters of mercury, this is called EG junction outflow obstruction in the Chicago 3.0 classification. Okay, so um, that's EGJ outflow, but doesn't achalasia also have a poorly relaxing LES during swallows? Yes, it does. But lack of normal peristalsis is also required to make a diagnosis of achalasia. And that is the difference between achalasia and EGJOO. EGJOO does have at least some peristalsis in the esophageal body. And so in terms of symptoms, I'm assuming that both achalasia patients and EGJ outflow have the same kind of swallowing problems? You'd think so, but it is actually a bit more complicated and confusing than that. When EGJOO was first described in the Chicago 3.0 classification, up to 10% of patients undergoing esophageal manometry were identified as having this pattern. At first, some people thought that this was a form of early achalasia, but it turns out that's not the case a lot of the time. It was also very unclear what investigations should be pursued beyond a gastroscopy. Studies were done using CT and endoscopic ultrasound, but generally, the yield was low. Furthermore, it turned out that a lot of the patients who had EGJOO on manometry did not actually report obstructive symptoms such as dysphagia or non-cardiac chest pain. Okay, so I'm hearing that um, some patients with this might have symptoms, or it could also be an artifact, I suppose, of the manometry process. So can you tell a little bit more about um, what are the causes of EGJ outflow? It sounds like it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag as far as etiologies go. For sure. Studies have shown several factors which are associated with this finding of EGJOO on manometry. And I want to stress that it is actually a finding, not a distinct diagnosis or disease like achalasia. So the most common situation is that the patient is on either opioid or anticholinergic medication. Opioid and anticholinergic medication can be associated with an EGJOO pattern on manometry. A structural cause such as a missed ring or stricture at the G junction or even a hiatus hernia sometimes can create this pattern. It is very important to put the finding in a clinical context, which is why a good history looking for obstructive symptoms is important. 
It turns out that based on the older Chicago 3.0 diagnostic criteria, many patients who did not have obstructive symptoms yet had EGJOO on manometry. Eventually, this went away on repeat manometry and whatever other symptoms they had resolved on its own as well. So this was not a clear pathological finding. So can I take you back to something you said about narcotics and their effect on the lower esophageal sphincter mimicking what manometrically looks like an EGJ outflow obstruction? Have you seen cases of patients who had failure of LES to relax while they're on narcotic analgesia and then the medication is stopped and the manometry has been repeated? Yes, I have. And not a lot because many of these patients are on chronic opioid medication for chronic pain and are simply unable to come off it. But in those who have been able to stop it, I have seen complete normalization of the IRP and um, they no longer qualify for this diagnosis of EGJOO. Okay, so I guess one takeaway is to interpret esophageal manometry studies with caution in patients who are in opiate analgesia, yeah, yeah? Also, you know, when we scope patients and we take biopsies, we often get a report back from the pathologist that says clinical pathologic correlation is required. I think that clinical manometric correlation is required as well when it comes to our motility tests. Okay, so it sounds like uh, under the old 3.0 classification, there was some confusion and perhaps even overcalling the diagnosis of EGJ outflow obstruction. Talk a little bit about some of the refinements that were made with the new version, the 4.0 classification. Sure. Um, so in the Chicago 4.0 classification, a finding of EGJOO on manometry is always considered clinically inconclusive which means that you really need to center it in the patient's context. Furthermore, measurement of the IRP is done both in the supine or semi-supine position as well as a second position, ideally upright. When we do a traditional supine manometry, we are trying to eliminate the effect of gravity But gravity is actually an important factor and can definitely help tell us if there is uh, retention in the esophagus. So you need to see a high IRP in two separate positions. And furthermore, uh, again, looking at the uh, retention in the esophagus, 20% or more of swallows should have increased intrabolus pressure in the supine position. And lastly, the same as in Chicago 3.0, there must be peristalsis in the esophageal body. And this is how we differentiate EGJOO from achalasia. Okay, so in a patient with dysphagia who has a failure of the LES to relax both in supine upright positions um, and with intrabolus pressure increase, you would make a diagnosis of EGJ outflow obstruction, yeah? Not quite yet. There's more. (laughs) Um, So, yes, symptoms are very important. So uh, in Chicago 4.0, symptoms are front and center. You need obstructive symptoms such as dysphagia or non-cardiac chest pain. So that is key. But you need even more objective evidence of obstruction. And this can be achieved um, in a couple of different ways depending on your resources. One way to do it is with a timed barium esophagram with either a barium tablet or barium-coated marshmallows or using FLIP technology. So tell me more about this timed barium swallow. Is it the same as just a standard uh, barium esophagogram? No, it's not. Uh, A standard uh, barium swallow is actually double contrast, so both carbon dioxide and barium. The time barium esophagram is a completely different protocol. It's single contrast with just barium. The patient sits upright and is given a glass of 200 cc's of barium. They are asked to drink that fairly quickly, and they are then x-rayed against a background with a ruler. In someone where there is actual outflow obstruction from the esophagus, the barium will be retained, creating a column. 
and this is measured on the ruler behind the patient. An x-ray is taken at time zero, one minute, two minutes, and five minutes later, and the column of bearing is measured at each time interval. If there is still a column of five centimeters in height or greater at the five minute mark, that is considered a positive result for retention. But remember, this is a liquid. Barium is a liquid and bolus transit is different for liquids and solids in the esophagus. So it helps to have something mimic a solid. And depending on your local resources, you can either use a tablet that's made of barium or baby marshmallows that are coated in barium. And you can see whether they are retained in the esophagus and where. Okay, so I can see how the time barium swallow can be very useful. But you also mentioned flip technology. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. So FLIP is an acronym and stands for Functional Luminal Imaging Probe. It consists of a probe which has a balloon in the distal end, and the material on the balloon is very distensible. The balloon is placed across the G-junction and gradually filled with water. At various volumes, the diameter of the lumen at the G-junction and the distensibility are measured. And these are more accurate assessments of the lumen in particular than just the scope passing through. Um, and they can give us a sense of whether there is obstruction there as well. Let's just see if we can put this all together. So let's say you have someone with EGJ outflow on manometry by Chicago 4.0 criteria and you have retention of liquid barium on the time barium swallow, and you have slow passage, for example, of the marshmallows, and you have an endoflip with a decreased distensibility index. What would you, how would you summarize that, and where would you go from there? So that scenario that you described is fairly clear that the, there is real EGJOO, not just manometric EGJOO. So something is affecting the outflow at the G-junction. If you haven't scoped the patient yourself, I think it is very important to do so again and carefully assess the G-junction both on foreview and on retroflexion, the cardia with different levels of insufflation. As I said before, lots of things can be missed. Um, short strictures and even rings and also look for a hiatus hernia. Sometimes the angle of hiss is affected in a hiatus hernia and the flap valve can give a, an outflow obstruction type picture as well. And if none of these things are present, I think this is the type of situation where, of course, ruling out opioid medication, anticholinergic medication, other prior surgery, you might want to consider further imaging, such as EUS or maybe even CT. But I would caution that that would not be something that you would do routinely. Okay. Any treatments that you would maybe use at this point for EGJ outflow obstruction? So it depends, as with many things in medicine. It depends on the severity of the patient's symptoms. If there are any obvious modifiable factors, such as medications that can be stopped. if the symptoms are not severe if the patient has no red flags such as weight loss. It might be worthwhile to give it time and see what happens. If this is one of those situations where there might be a motility disorder, another motility disorder in evolution, such as early achalasia, repeating a manometry in one or two years might give you a clearer picture. If the patient is quite symptomatic, quite bothered, and really does need something done, I always try to go from the least invasive or risky intervention first. So one of the things to consider is botulinum toxin injection into the G-junction. Okay. Uh, would you ever be more aggressive like an endoscopic balloon dilatation, for example? I have done so um, in some patients. Not a lot of them, but uh, it can help. I wouldn't go there first, particularly with pneumatic balloon dilation, because there are higher risks, 3% uh, risk of, of perforation. So 
you have to weigh pros and cons in the patient's context or comorbidities, the degree of, of symptoms, that sort of thing. Okay, well, that's, uh, that's fascinating. And it's really good to see some refinement in our clinical criteria, because this is a, a difficult group of patients to sort out, as you have shown us. Are there any features on manometry that you haven't talked about that have been brought up in 4.0 that might help us in this situation? There are a couple of other things that we can do, uh, especially in cases that are inconclusive. One of the common provocative maneuvers that are done during a manometry study is called a rapid drink challenge. So the patient is sitting upright and they are asked to drink 150 cc's of water quickly from a glass through a straw and then stop swallowing. And this can give information about a couple of things. It can force the LES to relax better if it can. And if not, you can sometimes see pressurization as a result of true EGJ outflow obstruction. So that can be very helpful if it is present. The other thing that one can do is use a solid meal rather than just liquid or viscous swallows, particularly if the patient's symptoms are more prominent with solids. And this can also give more prominent intrabolus pressure measurements and clearer retention, particularly if um, you are also using impedance with your manometry. Okay. Well, that is excellent. Thank you for that review, Adriana. And thanks to our listeners um, for uh, being with us today. And Consider subscribing to our channel on iTunes and also on our YouTube channel, which is Gastroenterology 101. Please subscribe and give us a rating. And stay tuned for more episodes. See you again soon. Bye. Bye.